Hello, and welcome to the last edition of the Schmidt series with our friend Nils here. Um, sorry for the hold up, actually. I finally got that new mic, but unfortunately, I boomer teched and figuring out how to set it up. So hopefully, it sounds a lot better now. So thank you for joining us again. And without further ado, we'll just jump straight into it. So to start with, because we're doing part two and three of Homo Soccer today. So just to start with part two right off the bat. This is where Agamben fleshes out the figure of Homo, Homo Soccer in significantly more detail. So just to situate the section a bit, Agamben is providing a counter to the story that we commonly hear about the origin of politics which are usually various forms of social contract theory where people voluntarily give up their power to the government so the government can then provide them security and justice. So according to social contract theory, the reason we follow the law is because we sign our names to it in exchange for the security and freedom that the state guarantees. Now, Gombin is going to challenge this conception by arguing that the origin of politics actually comes from the apparent but not real distinction between outside the law and inside the law. So to be both inside and outside the law, Agamben calls that to be under the ban or abandonment. And as we said with Schmidt and the Sovereign, that the Sovereign is both inside and outside the law because the Sovereign is able to suspend the law. The Sovereign has the right to kill the man that is inside and outside the law, that man being the homo soccer. So still under the influence of Schmidt's political theology, Agamben is looking to fit to this figure of homo soccer and Roman law that blurs between the sacred and the political. So as we said in the last episode, the homo soccer or the sacred man is one who can be killed but not sacrificed. So killed without punishment, but he can't be sacrificed. So Agamben understands this as the intersection between divine law and human law, remaining outside of both of them. Purely, that is. So Agamben gives a long history of the psychologization of the sacred in 20th century thought, which I'll leave that aside because it's more of the technical history he's trying to get over to set up how he views the sacred. But he argues that the sacred and the political need to be separated to see where they come to overlap. So the homo soccer is subject to a double exception. The homo soccer is not given over to God and he's accepted from the human law as well, the law against killing. So the killing of homo soccer is a violence excluded from both laws, with the sovereign also existing in the state of exception as that which suspends law and captures life within the law. The homo soccer is a life under the sovereign ban. And Agamben argues that this, rather than social contract, is the original constitution of sovereignty. So the production of bare life is the basic activity of the sovereign. So Agamben and to quote him, he says that the sovereign is the one with re one with respect to whom all men are potentially sacred lives. And homo soccer is the one with respect to, to whom all men act as sovereigns. So this joining together of the sovereign and homo soccer accept, accepted from divine and human laws for a gob in the origin of the Western political space. So he then goes on to examine Foucault's definition of the characteristic of sovereignty as the right to decide life and death. And he gives a history of this in the Roman through the uh, examining the Roman word vita, which is a sort of combination of Zoe and bios, but rather in the context of a father's power over uh, the people in his household, uh, his slaves, his woman. So the father of the people, the sovereign, always has the power of death over the subjects that are participating in the bios. The bare life becomes inscribed into the juridical political order. So life in the city, your political participation, is subject to the power of death on condition of a doubled exception that constitutes the homo soccer. So the sacred then becomes an indistinction in which Zoe and bios constitute each other, which is something we talked about in the first episode. So Agamben gives kind of a funny, interesting, concrete example of this. He takes up the idea of the werewolf in, into a European mythology, and he goes to show that the state of nature is not something pre-existing the political, but is rather internal to the political. So the animalization of man and the humanization of the wolf is the zone of indistinction, which is the sacred on which sovereign power rests. This is why you always hear you know, the figure of the, rope, uh, the wolf brought up as, you know, the rebel, 
you know, you're hunting the wolf, you're an outcast. This is why that this is where that figure comes from. So the state of nature in which someone may be killed points to the ongoing maintenance of the city and the state. So the sovereign's decisions, continual use of the state of exception shows that we are always in this indistinct zone between law and nature, law and exception. So that is part two in a nutshell. Um, FZ, I know that there is something in particular on this section you wanted to bring up. So why don't you jump right into it and give your first take on part two. Uh, thanks. Uh, that was a that was a pretty good uh, a summary. I think this is actually where all the load bearing features of a gambin's view come into full focus because you know the first uh, the first book or the first part which we were discussing last week is you know it's it's kind of this interesting theorization redolent of Schmidt. Uh, a Gambin comes through as a kind of Schmidtian of the left. Uh, he's developing different features of what it is to be sovereign, what, what sovereignty is, its relation to the state of exception, and so on. Uh, but what he's really concerned with is addressing the same kind of thing, as I was saying last week, that a figure like uh, Arendt, Hannah Arendt, was uh, focused on addressing, which is this problem in modernity of liminal figures who are neither inside nor outside power, uh, who therefore in some sense have, you know, no protection. They provide a kind of, they provide a kind of uh, paradoxical field for power, for studying power, for the law, but also therefore for questions of morality. And um, as I kind of, as I think I mentioned last week, Arendt's answer to to this conundrum, uh, which Agamben draws attention to as well, is insufficient because she basically says, uh, "Look, the problem of the refugee in modernity is that it's this whole class, it's this whole new class of people who, uh, who, first of all, are, are continually growing. So by the time." Uh, by the time of the first world war, even I think they number in the they number in the millions. Uh, white Russians, that is to say, Russians who have been exiled or who are in self exile from, um, <clears throat> from uh, the the uh, Soviet regime later on in the war, uh, and various others. And so, uh, basically, I mean to to make a long story short. Arendt uh, says that the problem of the refugee uh, comes to its apogee during the the Second World War, when practically every state has laws, has introduced laws at some point in the interstate, in the interwar period, uh, that allows them to uh, denationalize huge proportions of their own citizenry. And they're doing this for different reasons. They're doing it for reasons of uh, ideological cleanliness. Uh, they're doing it for reasons of ethnic or national or racial cleanliness. Uh, in the case of Germany, uh, obviously the Jews are denationalized. In the case of, you know, Belgium, which you you wouldn't think if you weren't aware of the history, uh, I think a whole swathe of people who had cooperated with the, with the German occupation during the First World War were simply denationalized. Uh, a whole load of bureaucrats and so on. Part of Arendt's analysis of this is to say Look clearly. This is not just uh, the the way you know a a, a well-meaning bourgeois citizen might think of it. This isn't just something that happens to the down and out. This isn't just something that happens to the poor, or to lumpen proles, or or something like that, or to the mentally ill. Anyone can be taken up into this sovereign ban. And in fact, very many were made refugees during that period. Very many, you could say, of certainly bourgeois people, all members of the managerial class, bureaucrats, and so on and so forth, educated people. Uh, Arendt's solution to this basically is to say uh, that precisely because, or, or rather, the way she untangles this issue is to say, look, human rights were supposed to be there the way they were originally theorized uh, precisely for this situation. Human rights are supposed to be there to ensure that man as such man when he's stripped of his national relationship and affiliations and 
the the protections that come with that man uh taken out of the the shadow but also the 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 kind of protective shadow that zone of protection of a sovereignty should have these human rights to have recourse to but that's precisely she points out when everything went to shit because uh, you know none of these none of these uh, organizations that were supposed to take care of refugees in various ways uh could could do very much at all i mean uh the the criticism agamben gives is to say they in fact participated in uh, in, in a kind of denationalization and then demanning a, a stripping down to bare life uh, of these of these denationalized masses of these refugees uh, the problem Agamben basically has with Arendt's view which ultimately kind of uh, which which ultimately becomes a kind of Americanist one I think it would be fair to say uh, one in which she's basically arguing for the 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 birth of and maintenance of a new uh global school of shall we say rights thinking which really takes on this problem of uh ensuring rights outside of the context of sovereignty outside of this kind of shadow cast by the civil specter of the sovereign um uh you know that that as it were uh we 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 have to advance human rights discourse and the realities of human rights to a level where uh these failures of the second world war won't happen again whereas i think agamben rightly points out in the second section uh this is something that recurs this is something that wasn't really a specific problem of the interwar period or of or of the second world war this is something that existed before that and something that exists up to now our relation to power precisely lies in this what he what he calls a politicization of zoe you know the the politicization of bare life happens precisely because of this i would say bourgeois he doesn't say this but this kind of bourgeois declaration of rights if if uh, this is the way you see liberalism this is the way you see uh one significant part of the project of modernity uh the problem that rises to the fore is that if you care about yourself if you consider yourself as a man as therefore you know uh, that what's applicable to you is this is this is this category of human rights rights as such the rights of man rather than the rights of the citizen and the privileges and prerogatives of the citizen uh the the problem that arises from that is that you are then inscribed uh, your individual life and your bare life are inscribed within the very state order this is what the state is ostensibly supposed to protect uh but it brings you as bare life uh, uh into into the ambit of a kind of figure that is simultaneously producing your bare life so that really this is all productive of the problem that uh you know a, a figure that you know a scholar like a rent would say well this is first of all what state and beyond it uh interstate organizations should try and prevent or try and paper over whereas agamben is really saying there is no way of papering it over this is something uh this is something you know born into or this is something um essential to the politics of the state itself Got any comment on that Thamso? No, it's a really good summary. It gets to a lot of uh what Gomin takes up in part three as well. I mean, because that's the main critique that Gomin is given of modern politics in the West, and in fact, uh the whole idea of biopolitics at the beginning of what he would point to the French Declaration of um Universal Rights, right? When he when a when a god he when he, on the chapter um the political politica, sorry i can't speak today the political politicization of life in the 20th century a goblin he's making the argument that all the victories that they make in the name of individual rights and liberties comes to inscribe bare life into the political order more fully so that's 
for him to transition from politics to biopolitics, marking more control over bear life into the state order itself. So this affirmation of private over the public marks the power of the sovereign into control over reproductive life and natural life as a whole. And so he says that democratic and totalitarian states, they can shift back and forth between each other because they're both dealing with um, the maintenance of bare life. So modern democracy, when it's battled, when it battled against absolutism, it wasn't centered on bios, but it was instead centered on propping up Zoe, bare life over the political life or the life of inscription. And so he says this is modern democracy's strength and its contradiction. It doesn't abolish bare life, but it spreads it into every individual body in which your participation comes out of simply by being born rather than being under a sovereign power. You're born into this biopolitical order by virtue simply of your reproductive life. And you become part of the body politic itself rather than this absolutism that... Um, this pre-mod, this pre-modern absolutism that exercises sovereign control over its subjects. Instead, you're born into this, and you have you're subject to this maintenance of, of, um, of Zoe of reproductive life. And so, the origin of rights, of this idea of human rights, becomes inscribed into the political order. It becomes the area in which you're subject to. Um, every aspect of sovereign power into your life and maintenance over it precisely because sovereign power comes to be defined as this inclusion even more so than it did in the past in the pre-modern of uh, Zoe into Bios. And so when he's criticizing Hannah Arendt, as you said, who props up this very humanitarian counter to totalitarianism is that it leaves this zone between... Um, this zone of the zone of freedom away from state power it separates it and creates this, this creates this idea that you have something like an order of human rights that you could um, that you could claim as opposed to 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 set yourself apart from the exercise of state power when in actuality that very zone of Zoe becomes a part of how state power actually functions and it becomes the global uh, nomos of the earth is that becomes this giant, basically, in um, Agamben's term, this giant camp, this concentration camp. So Agamben would think that Aaron is being insufficiently critical in dealing with the problem and that this modern liberal democracy of taking up this idea of rights actually extends sovereign power into every aspect of our lives. And so it's a very, a very interesting critique. And I think there's a lot to it there. Um, Nils, what do you think about that? I think one of the most important things brought up here is the kind of paradox that the modern national state, which is usually uh, associated with, at least by liberals, associated with uh, hampering personal freedom, and the freedom of its subjects, uh, which should probably not even feel to be subjects because in a democracy, they basically, by ways of representation, more or less make the laws and thus make, uh, they, are, they are not, they are not uh, subjected uh, to, to state power, but rather subjected themselves. And uh, I guess we discussed most of this this uh, this concept of uh, democracy and its its weird ways of applying political power before, but uh, as you said, the 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 common liberal desire is to to stay away from state power to exercise liberties and freedoms uh, as unhampered as possible, whereas the nation state, the modern nation state, is actually the one single entity to uh, protect the so-called universal and unalienable human rights, as exemplified uh, by Agamben here in uh, this, this more or less political, exceptional archetype of the refugee, because in the very second, a 
person, a living being, the bare life, the uh, Zoe of, of this person becomes uh, unsheltered, homeless by uh, being expelled from the nation state it originally belonged to. Um, there's no other entity in power or legitimized to defend this person's rights. And uh, we've seen this, of, of course, uh, in the Second World War and before that, with uh, especially the uh, Jewish refugees from Germany, um, which uh, Hannah Arendt was mainly talking about, like, uh, for example, there were, there were many, many cases where these uh, passenger ships who crossed the Atlantic and tried to bring Jewish refugees to the United States or uh, to Palestine uh, were turned away because those uh, people were were uh, stripped of their their uh, German their German uh, uh, <laughs> their German uh, state civil Heard before uh, the the uh, Third Reich officials had set up a very efficient um, bureau to do that under the uh, the notorious uh, Adolf Eichmann, who was later hanged in in Israel after uh, he was captured in in Argentina, or Brazil, I think it was Brazil. Anyway, and uh, because those people were stateless they were displaced persons and they were the archetypal refugees um pretty much anything could be done to them without uh, pretty much anything could be done to them with impunity because there was no uh legal or political power to protect them and uh, this is the basic paradox of freedom that we also see nowadays um people try and want to get away from the state as much as they can um, in ways to to uh, uh, leaving leaving aside the the libertarians that's that's another case um, just just to 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 feel less threatened by state power and to exercise their own personal way of of being also on the right of the political spectrum uh, but in a in a in a theoretical ideal uh nation state uh this political power is the only protection they would have against uh yeah, enemy states against uh criminals on the streets and so uh by turning down this 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 hypothetical offer of uh nation state protection uh those people are basically shying away from the political in and of itself which is uh, also the uh the the basic critique agamben uh utters against uh, against those uh, those 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 models of of trying to reconcile refugees and the the refugee system if you may uh want if if you may call it that uh with the with, with our today's uh, more or less supranational and international system because uh, this leads to depolitization and uh, in a Schmidtian sense, uh, as we have already said, the political does not simply vanish from the earth, only those who are not able or willing to engage in the political will eventually vanish because those are the weak ones. And in this case, uh, especially in this chapter, uh, Agamben makes out the refugees and uh, the system that turns them into refugees uh, as well as the weak ones because those systems that that uh, have to expel people that are uh, that are undesirables in their political system are obviously not able to deal with the uh, with the uh, hetero genius in their own system so this is this is a lot to take. Most people, I guess, uh, don't think of it in these terms. Usually, when it's about the the the, the refugees, uh, we think of the the current crisis in the Mediterranean, or uh, regarding this this precarious state uh, 
the precarious status of stateless people. Uh, we're used to think about places like Guantanamo Bay and uh, the the black sites uh, that the CIA and and other intelligence agencies used to run in, uh, let's say, a bit less concerned about human rights uh states like uh, belarus or uh, other states like that and uh it it, it takes a quite a bit of uh, of effort to see that this matter concerns us as well because especially as being on the right um you might as well face uh at one day in the more or less near future let's hope uh, it won't happen but it's uh all the more possible nowadays. Uh, we might also face state measures taken up against us uh, that come close to those problems, not exactly uh, being pushed out of the state and stripped of our citizenship, but uh, other measures like, like uh, being declared criminally insane once uh, racism becomes an uh, official uh, neuropathology or something like that and then uh, you get stripped of your rights to vote or to hold public office and this is uh, pretty much exactly what uh, Agamben has been talking about when uh, he said that the the the, the paradox between uh, nowadays late modern uh, Zoe and Bios lies in the fact that the very state everyone uh, conceded his his right to defend himself and and other rights to just to be protected and represented in parliament uh, is also able to uh, take these rights away from you and simply declare you a uh, non citizen only a human being and uh, thus more or less just a uh, two legged animal. Let me let me actually jump in and uh, because I think where we've kind of taken it into into the third book and we maybe we haven't yet discussed the camp as a as a the, the a kind of precondition for modernity and the and the the chief condition of of modern life. But um, there's there's a kind of question I want to ask you both concerning uh, some of these interesting examples and paradoxes that that Agamben brings up, because I think one of the reasons you could definitely see uh, the, see Homo Seiko as a a much more uh, a, a much kind of richer seedbed for understanding ideas like this than say you know origins of totalitarianism or something. Uh, is that even though they're trying to address, uh, ostensibly trying to address the same problem, uh, the same the same twentieth century problem, the same problem of modernity, you could say, uh, Schmidt, um, not Schmidt, uh, Arendt, you know, if you read if you read her work, it's this kind of not uninteresting, but but still ultimately stale historical exegesis, uh, which doesn't bring out any of the uh, sweet little paradoxes and you know really archaic aporias that uh, Agamben is fully engaged with, and I think that's one way that you could really view this work. That's the way Homo Sacred is structured. That there's a central paradox to each of the sections. So in the first section, there's that kind of essential Schmidian paradox of um, the the state of norms in the state of exception, or or sovereignty's relation in the state of exception, the fact that it stands as a center, uh, both inside and outside or above a system. Um, uh, in the third section, obviously, he, he's going to comment that uh, what we think of as free, uh, you know, fully liberated democratic life uh, is really just an in, an instance of the same kind of thing that that's going on in the concentration camp there's that paradox there but in the second book uh, the the paradox i think he's concerned with i think he he basically spends the first half of the book uh, first half of that section trying to unravel it is this paradox of what you might call sacredness which at least when translated into english uh, presents a kind of barrier to us. I think it presents a, a barrier also in other languages like French, where if I say sacred, 
most people's minds will immediately jump to, uh, uh, you know, the idea that something is hallowed, the sense that it is, you know, sacredness is supposed to encompass this kind of uh, religious or, or quasi-religious quality of a thing, which means that it's hallowed. In the sense that it's untouchable, it's also there to be protected. It's something that's precious. Um, and this is, you know, so on the surface of things, the fact that he says, the definition he gives of homo sacer is, or sacred man, is as someone who can be killed by anyone and whose, whose killing is unpunishable, but whose sacrifice is banned, who can't be sacrificed, that this provides a kind of... Uh, a difficulty which first needs to be untangled because it it conflicts with our first understanding of what of what sacrality means. Why would you call someone who anyone is allowed to kill without punishment sacred? Surely a sacred thing is supposed to be protected. Um, so I don't know, Thamster. I, I mean, we could talk about this unendingly, but uh, I think this has a kind of really distinct. This is in a way a problem of political theology. Would you agree? It's interesting that Schmidt himself kind of doesn't remark on it, but I think you can, um, obviously it was, it was perhaps outside of his area of expertise, though I think he does remark on it in one place. I mean, he has a familiarity with, with, the, with the, some of Roman law, Roman legal codes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about reading this concept out of a gambon back into the work of Schmidt when he's talking about um, uh, when he's talking about you know the partisan, uh, the enemy within the state, and so on. Well, I mean, I think he's entirely um, aiming towards a sort of political theology when he talks about the sacred man, because the the name of the chapter is the ambivalence of the sacred, right? So ambivalence is this ambiguous zone of indistinction between the law of man and the law of God. So it becomes a sacred figure when um, he's outside of the human law. So he's allowed to be killed without punishment, right? So the figure can't, um, he doesn't fall under the category of human law, but he's not given up to God. He's not sacrificed either. So he becomes this figure that's outside of the law of God and outside the law of man. So he becomes a sacred figure, this zone of indistinction between human law and divine law. But if you're, if you're outside of the parameters of being put up to God for judgment, then essentially you are a sort of sacred figure because you're outside of the zone of judgment. You're outside of God's law, but you're also outside of man's law, but you're not really pure animal either you're not pure zoe because if you were then um then you wouldn't be also somewhat inscribed into the political legal order by means of a exclusive inclusion so it, it goes back to the pro previous paradox that when you're under that law you're in that law you're you're included in it precisely by means of exclusion so it's not pure uh, Zoe either. It's not pure animal life, but it's not under the divine law. So it becomes this sacred indistinction in which it's not merely a leftover category of a religious law or like a psychologization, but it's rather at the very origin of the political itself, which there's no pre-existing state of nature. So it's a separation between the political zone of man and the political and the animal life, it shows that there is no state of nature, is that there's always this indeterminable, indiscernible leftover that itself constitutes the political and the maintenance of the state and constitutes the sovereign. So the sacred actually is that which constitutes the sovereign itself. So do you see what I'm getting at here? So it's it's actually that figure, the homo soccer, the sacred outside that could be killed but not sacrificed, is actually the precondition for the sovereign and the city and the state as a whole. So that's it takes on a very constituting role. So I don't know what, what you think about that, FC, what you think about my interpretation or nils. I think that's a, 
that's a fine interpretation. I mean, like I skipped over and then in the course of asking you the question, uh, we both skipped over, I think, an interesting, uh, a related but somewhat tangential thing, which is to say that the first way that this supposed paradox was, you know, worked out in the field of sociology or anthropology, anthropology of religion, you could say, um, was in, in the work of these 19th century scholars who were trying to, to, to come to grips, you could say, with this ambivalent status of the sacred. And he, he out of interest, he kind of mentions one whom I think uh, will appeal, whose view I think will appeal to the horrorist uh, in, in us, um, which I think is kind of Lovecraftian, uh, which is, I think, Wilhelm Wundt's thesis. Uh, which is that this this concept of you know that this concept this ambivalence basically arises from the most archaic or originary period of our history, where you know uh, our idea of re our, our religious concepts or our religious experience, if you would call it that, was dominated by an an indistinction between what we could call sacred and impure, clean and impure, uh, where you know, I think he even uses the word sacred horror, you know, it, it implies both veneration and terror at the same time. Um, I think that's a, you know, if you were to come at that with, uh, you know, the kind of Katzian, Katzian language of an originary scene and, and um, you know, the, the implication, the implication of uh, a reaction, say, to a corpse or uh, a reaction to a food item or even a reaction to later on to a kind of animal totem, uh, which, which I think is is uh, arises even in a gambin when he's discussing this figure, which we also kind of skipped over from uh, from archaic Germanic lore, this figure of the Vargus, right, a wolf or wolf man, basically, a figure uh, who is obviously meant to indicate some kind of terror or some kind of danger, a threat to others, uh, who can safely be killed one could say just out of necessity and who must be killed out of necessity uh, but who can't be sacrificed and he i think he takes it in an interesting direction because the way i think you you basically gave you basically restated the answer well he does find a solution to this apparent ambiguity of the sacred uh by saying that you know the way this is resolved is by uncovering an originary political structure which is located in the zone prior to any distinction we might have, uh, any civilized distinction, you could think, between sacred and profane, between the concepts religious and juridical, uh, between even the concepts, you know, law and exception. Uh, the, very, the very original, you know, you, I think it wouldn't be too much to say that for a gambin, the birth of politics itself is uh, this kind of originary figure of life taken into a sovereign ban that that the figure of homo seca kind of preserves an archaic memory of an originary inclusive exclusion through which the political dimension was actually first constituted uh it's interesting i think that a scholar of the left would have a view like this one uh particularly in the in the way he develops it uh when he brings up uh the the doctrine of the king's two bodies I'm not sure if you wanted to comment on that too. I just found that uh, I found that part of the text interesting as well. Well, actually, go ahead and uh, talk about that doctrine of the king's two bodies, if you want, if you will. Yeah, I mean, basically, to uh, to summarize this, uh, this is a thesis from uh, a '50s a a, a, gene a historical genealogist, you could say or a genealogist of the concept of sovereignty from the from the 50s i forget his name now uh who who Hans basically Kampolovitz. yes yes it's a, i mean it's a it's actually a really really famous work i think there were multiple classes in which it was referenced or in which in which uh, i had to read it during my undergraduate uh program uh basically i mean he he's he's developing this kind of genealogy of the 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 conceptualization of sovereignty that comes out of 
and and also the the symbology of of, uh, of sovereignty that that eventuates in someone like Hobbes, Hobbes's Leviathan as a sovereign composed of uh, smaller men, and of this this essential distinction between uh, the the body of the sovereign and the body politic. Basically, the the idea of the king's two bodies is that in the person of the sovereign there is a you could say a a, a normal decaying human body, Zoe, bare life, uh, which obviously eventually dies, uh, but that in in the king consists this kind of second, more eternal body, which means that the sovereignty never dies. When the bare life, when the body, when the king's body dies, it merely passes out of <clears throat> it merely passes out of him uh, into the next king, uh, and so in this way, you know. He, he's basically working from Baudin. Uh, Baudin's talking about this in the context of, Jean Baudin is basically talking about this in the context of saying, look, sovereignty never ceases. Uh, when, when the French king dies, sovereignty never really passes away. It just, it kind of, uh, it, it transmigrates, you could say, out of one body into another. That's a, that's a kind of brief summary of the concept. But uh, Agamben takes it up in an interesting way to say that this in, an, in its own way is kind of uh, analogous to, but uh, analogous to, but in, a, in, a, in an interesting way, um, not analogous of the, the idea of sacred man. Because there is this conception, you could say, of two, two natures or two, two bodies, two, two existences, Zoe and, and Bios. Uh, but in the case of the king, this kind of bare body, which will die, and this kind of sovereign body to which, in any case, all bare life is subjected in, the, in this, this field of indistinction which constitutes sovereignty and the originary political position. Nels, you look like you want to jump in there earlier. No, I just I just uh, thought about the same thing before FC uh, got onto it. Um, I guess it's it's important to keep in mind this 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 uh, differentiation between uh, two bodies or or entities when talking about the same person. Um, we might argue about whether or not this whole thing applies to the concept of homo soccer. Uh, in terms of uh, the the allowance to kill the the homo sacer as a political being that is as a citizen of uh, whatever uh, political entity uh, chose to expel him and declare him an, an undesirable and a homo sacer and and to ban him uh, effectively to to banish him. Uh, but not killing his 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 Zoe body, his uh, bare life form, because uh, at least in in uh, ancient Greece, the life in and of itself was seen to be given by the gods, and thus uh, men uh, must not take it away uh, away, otherwise it would be. Uh, it would be considered hubris and thus a a, a a crime punishable by death itself. Or whether this, this whole thing about not sacrificing him uh, would actually uh, mean something like by sacrifice you would, regarding a human being, not an animal, you would actually uh, kill off his divine entity, his... Uh, his ethereal body or whatever you would want to call it. Um, I guess this is left open to debate, but uh, the, the uh, permission to kill a man but not sacrifice him and thus uh, transcend him into, into something like, like a, a gift to the gods, um, this obviously not uh, not result out of a notion of this person being impure or or uh, stained 
uh, or soiled in, in some uh, transcendental way, but rather a, a, uh, a, a thing out of respect for a certain, uh, a certain part of his being that is not touched by whatever crime he may have committed. And by the declaration of him, uh, as being uh, a, a, an outcast, as uh, carrying the head of a wolf, so uh, this is this might be more or less the 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 difference between his his earthly mortal body that can be killed and his eternal self that must not be destroyed by him being sacrificed to uh, whatever god possible. Yeah, I mean, this is taking an interesting turn because this is actually harkens back to what, what you and FC have been saying here. It gets back to the point I was making, actually, in the very first Schmidt stream on political theology, where the idea of all political concepts are secularized theological concepts. And what I was trying to say was, was that it's not merely that theological concepts of governance get taken over into modernity to just become a secular version of them in the sense that, you know, the sacred is something that is just a part of the political order and that sacred just changes, but rather that the theological concepts, the idea of sacrality and the sacred as the origin of the political as a whole becomes the ground on which modern politics and all politics is actually to be fought in because if the if the sacred man the one who could be killed and not sacrificed is the is what constitutes the sovereign and you could see right now for example we talked about this last stream where um you know the distant right is being treated as the way they treated islamic terrorism that they're cracking down on us using what they learned from fighting islamic terrorism they're using us as this essentially homo soccer and you could see saker sorry you could see um as i mentioned last stream the way augustus is being treated right now which is interesting because when i wrote the north american compact statement for him i actually included the idea of homo saker as a way that we're going to be <laughs> that we're going to be treated right and so it ended up happening of course but the point i was i was making here is that if the sacred comes to constitute the political as a whole this is why agamben following schmidt and he's perfectly in fidelity to schmidt here is why i said it's not just a matter of theological concepts of metaphors that are used as justifications for power but rather that is the constitution of the sovereign is sacrality this is why agamben's answer is always messianic it's always a political theology it's always theology with a capital T, right? Because Agamben takes up the figure of St. Paul as taking hold of this messianism in which um, Jesus is killed by the Roman authorities. And he becomes like this figure that points to a messianic reappropriation of the sacred that is in, contrad uh, that is in contradiction to the Roman imperial authority. And regardless of what we think about that, the point is that Agamben sees this messianism, this reorienting of the sacred as the constitution of politics as the ground in which we have to fight uh, modern liberal democracy in the sense of liberalism and the language of rights as taking up uh, Zoe into the political sphere in which it ha the sovereign has excess o excessive power over all aspects of our life and reproductive life. And becomes this global nomos that becomes the nomos of the earth. So he's saying a messianic re reorientation of the sacred in which the werewolf figure, so think of us, think of Augustus, the way in which the werewolf is the one who could be marked to be killed, right? The animalization of man or the humanization of the animal is this sacred figure in which it gives birth to a messianic appropriation, in which we are constructing a new conception of sovereignty and politics from within this indiscernible space in which human law 
in the sense that we experience it now is um, opposed to us. So we are essentially giving birth to a new, a new sacred, a new sense of the sovereign. And this is what I think is the task of dissident right politics going forward, which actually gets back to in the very first Schmidt stream, which is why this is so interesting, is that I don't think there's ever an escape from Schmidt, nor should there be, but that rather the strong the theology side, in the sense not of, uh, when we talk about confessional theology, it gets a little more difficult. But regardless, for where we stand, is that the messianic appropriation of the sacred is the ground in which we are fighting distant right politics going forward. And to the audience, it, that might sound a bit like just a, appropriating a kind of romantic religious direction against the current liberal order, but not so much the case, because if you follow the arguments that Gombin's making, it's 100% about how sovereignty is constituted. Right, so what would you guys think about that? I would say you're right, especially when it comes down to the legacy of Schmidt seen from our perspective right now, because um, even in his early interwar period works like uh, Die Geistesgeschichtliche, uh, Die Geistesgeschichtliche Krise des heutigen Parlamentarismus, which was translated into English, uh, Die Geistesgeschichtliche Lage des heutigen Parlamentarismus, which was translated into English as uh, the crisis of parliamentary democracy. He basically constituted that the age of the nation state was over and that uh, the, the First World War uh, merely marked its, its the end of its final stage with a big bang, but it had been uh, over ever since, uh, yeah, ever since the, 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 it had been more or less over ever since the, the upcoming of the industrialization and, and stuff like that, because to Schmidt, uh, the modern nation state was uh, tied to an authoritarian monarchical system like uh, Hobbes would have uh, would have supported um, and Schmidt would later uh, after the uh, after the rise of the National Socialists uh, even rewrite some of his own stuff to uh, make his stance on this whole nation state thing uh, more make it appear more rigid and he would uh, especially when it's uh, when it comes uh, especially looking at the concept of the political which was at first a, a an essay he wrote for a uh, for a magazine in 1927 i believe when it was republished as a as an as an expanded work in 1932 uh this is more or less version version 2.0 and uh, then it got uh, republished again in 1933 after uh, the rise to power uh, of of uh, hitler and the national socialists and in there he uh, he ch he changed some uh, adjectives regarding hobbes very subtly so he uh, suddenly regarded uh, hobbes as a rather liberal thinker of course, because he was an Englishman and because he regarded uh, the monarchy and the, the absolutist state as uh, the epitome of the Leviathan that uh, protects his, uh, his, his subjects while, uh, while uh, exercising um, pure and, and uh, more or less perfect sovereignty. So uh, his, his views on this uh, changed a bit with his sometimes uh, opportunistic uh, stance, but nonetheless, since we now see uh, the nation states in rather sharp decline um, all over the world, sometimes uh, a little slower, sometimes a little faster, and uh, the obvious necessity for something to replace it, because as we have already said a few times, the political does not leave this world only, uh, only, only unfit and uh, unfeasible uh, 
peoples and states leave this world, uh, something has to step in the ever widening gap. And uh, this is more or less a, a, a chiliastic, a, an apocalyptic situation, and thus the religious steps back in. This is something we see in the the crisis of the of the of the Muslim states that uh, were also products of the First World War, largely or later the Second World War, and thus more or less um, products of the decay of the uh, European nation state model. And uh, this is going to continue to haunt us for uh, some more time until eventually some order, uh, I hate to say it, but some more or less new world order has been found. Uh, and the crisis of, of the nation state has solved in one way or another. You know, I think so the, 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 the quasi what what I was originally what I originally wanted to say is that the the quasi religious and uh, quasi theological elements of of Schmidt's writings will be the ones that uh, will grow more and more acute as we speak. Definitely. Uh, FC, right before you jump in there, I was just going to add that I think it's interesting that Nils used the term apocalyptic, which is another theological term I didn't get to, but it's very applicable here because apocalyptic comes from the word apocalypsis. Now, what that actually means is not the literal end of the world. It means um, a radical unveiling of some sort of truth that counters the current world order in such a way that it upsets the whole balance and it becomes a, basically a judgment on the world. Apocalyptic is this overturning of world order by a new revealed truth which is another important i think key term here when it comes to political theology uh fc you're going to jump in there I, that's an interesting observation it's a kind of i mean it it's 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 elementary political theology just in the sense that uh you can read into that the resurrection but what is an apocalypse if it is not the the end an end that is seen to be an end of one nomos and its replacement by another. It's literally the end of a, a world. This word nomos, this word nomos is actually hard to define. It, it, it's been taken up and used by various people, mostly following Schmidt, but, but sometimes before him. Uh, it doesn't have an exact translation. You know, it, it could mean order. In a way, it could actually mean a, a, an order as in a system, a, a, a world, so to speak. It, it could mean a, a command, it could mean a law. So uh, all, all of these things, um, all of these things kind of feed into each other. I was going to say uh, regarding that, but regarding uh, what Nils said and what you uh, intimated about, uh, about nationalism, um, I think one thing that really comes uh, out through, uh, through Schmidt's work, uh, Nomos of the Earth, uh, which we we should actually end up doing. It, it's kind of assumed reading for this whole month. I think we we must all have read it, but I but I think we should uh, dive into it one day because it does provide uh, it does provide answers to these precise questions. And I think one of the things that uh, most fascinated me reading it was exactly this suggestion: the suggestion that. You know, whatever you want to call the the Christian order of the Middle Ages, it was quite clearly an imperialistic one. Uh, it was openly imperialistic, just in the sense that uh, you know, one one had to recognize the primacy, depending on where what one was in the Christian world of the of the you know the Russian emperor or the Byzantine emperor or or, uh, or the Holy Roman emperor, uh, but that. You know the collapse of this order during during and after the the European wars of religion uh, kind of birthed this interesting period, which you could, in a way, consider to be a, a new nomos. I mean, that's what Schmidt called it. It was a new nomos of the earth, but a strangely a kind of a nomos that was peculiarly non-imperial in a in a truly unitary sense. It you know that that was. 
that period was a real kind of departure, a breaking for the first time with the idea, uh, with the ancient idea, but, but essentially the Christian idea, that there is only ever one emperor a at a time. There's only one uh, world emperor, so to speak. And that the future, ultimate, in the future, there will be a final world emperor who will, you know, who will invite God to earth and, and who is then a kind of prelude to the kingdom of heaven on earth. Um, but that, that new nomos that, that happened uh, was a kind of efflorescence, uh, a kind of birth of nations, and a, a, in the sense of a kind of obvious, in the sense of a birth of nationalism. But the end of the notion of a, of a unitary empire, but in fact the kind of coexistence despite a, a, a coexistence within a nomos that was agreed between them of uh, of several nations western european nations for the most part maybe russia would constitute a kind of exception uh where uh you had sovereign emperors all recognizing each other uh, ordering their own empires but existing within a kind of s super imperial uh, nomos, uh, a super imperial order which kind of uh, structured their relations as well. And what's interesting about the collapse of that nomos uh, before and, and during the crisis of the, of the 20th century was that, you know, the United States, first the United States and the Soviet Union uh, uh, are contesting a kind of nomos, but, but the United States comes out on top. And the weird thing is that this is this is not seen as a transformation by everyone. This is not seen as a transition to a new kind of nomos. I think Schmidt certainly saw it. Others certainly remarked upon it. But so much of the old, what is now the old nomos of the earth, that uh, that rule of of what uh, Schmidt calls European public law, um, s survives as a kind of. Uh, survives in various forms, but I think most importantly is this weird kind of cover for imperial designs, this weird kind of, um, it, it's, it's this kind of atavistic uh, super sovereign morality of nationalism, where what is really important is national sovereignty. And, and the United States too, you know, the, the United States, oh, it's just one nation among many others. It's just this one nation state it might be a bit bigger than than most others and and it might be a bit more powerful but really it's equal to all the others uh it, it's interesting that this particular nomos the nomos in which we live um which came after a kind of imperial wh what i mean to say when i say it, it came after an interregnum i mean it, it came after a period in which there was no single uh, emperor of the earth or, or imperial nomos, whereas now there really is only one. And, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question to see whether the breakdown of that will produce uh, a, a kind of second, shall we say, birth of nations, which I think is hinted at uh, in, in, in every vision that kind of, uh, that emphasizes multipolarity or, or, uh, a, a kind of Huntingtonian vision of the clash of civilizations, or you could say Dugan would definitely be an example of this. Whether the, the next nomos, you could say, is of a kind of an, an interregnum between imperial orders, or whether, as some have speculated, uh, you know, the imperial power of the United States will uh, either transform itself and, uh, and achieve a new kind of more honest imperial entity. Uh, or whether uh, you know a another another structure is kind of being prepared now is laying the ground to take on that that uh, historic task of ensuring an order of being uh, a kind of super sovereign of the earth. I think one can definitely read that out of uh, uh, out of a gambon. Nils, you want to respond to that? I know I actually have not read Nomos of the Earth. Please, panel, don't persecute me. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so we have um, to read that then. I, I yeah, could. Then we'd have uh, to, we'd I, have to I keep Nils forever. 
I don't really know how to tie this back to Agamben, but regarding this uh, this notion of uh, the 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 sole superpower left on the planet Earth would be the United States. This is something Schmidt actually more or less touched because um, this 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 moment in which one political power would actually rule all of the earth would more or less constitute judgment day to him as a uh, somewhat unorthodox but nonetheless pretty stout catholic and uh, regarding this and the the constant question that is also uh, i believe uh, a question that uh, catholic uh, dogmatic uh, teaching deals with is the question why the promised appearance of uh, the king of the earth which uh, <laughs> is not only a political but also a religious figure and the the true uh, judgment day after which uh, mankind and and uh, uh, the earth will be one with God again and, and stuff like that. Why this has not happened yet ever since it was promised uh, more than 2000 years ago. And uh, the answer to this question, uh, at least according to Schmidt, and I believe also according to, uh, to, to Christian Catholic uh, doctrine is to be found in uh, one of the, uh, one of the letters the 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 uh, Saint Paul sent out to uh, I'm, I'm I'm not that much into into the Bible obviously but nonetheless this this letter contains the at at, at a single point a figure called Kat uh, Echon in Greek which means he who holds back and from this uh, Schmidt devised the Kat Echon as a political figure that uh, that is pretty much the wild card of geopolitics. Uh, some some figure akin to the jester uh, in, in in other political mythologies, uh, which more or less keeps the 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 two main opponents on the 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 geopolitical stage from um, from getting it on and and fighting their final war and thus uh, eventually uh, bringing forth a sole ruler of the earth which would mean that this would be this this would mark the beginning of the 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 uh, the next eternal empire of of god on earth and uh, and the stuff uh, that Saint uh, John had seen on Patmos, which constitutes his uh, the, the 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 apocalypse within the Bible. And um, Schmidt, near the end of his life, uh, no 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 wait, Schmidt died in eighty five. Uh, anyway, um, he once when he talked about the figure of the Kat Echon as a as a geopolitical figure found uh, the current Kat Echon to probably be uh, Mao because uh, under Mao China gained access to nuclear weapons and thus could be the the third party to uh, the main block confrontation between uh, the US and the USSR. So th this were China in this way and, and Mao would uh, more or less defuse this 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 bomb that was already set uh, to to rein in uh, the apocalypse. And from there on, if we want to take up this this quasi uh, political theological figure, uh, we could just uh, speculate about uh, who, which person, which uh, country, which uh, geopolitical power has ever since uh, kept the world from being united under one single sovereign. And uh, well, nowadays it might be Vladimir Putin, uh, it might be uh, Xi Jinping. I believe anyone has, uh, has an opinion on this, but uh, we should not forget that when 
uh, the world finally becomes united under one uh, political entity, under one sovereign. Uh, this would reign in some stage of geopolitics or geo non-politics that we might not even be able to uh, to perceive right now. I mean, that's that's really fascinating. Yes, uh, I mean, Nils, Nils does have to come back and we, we have to do a Nomos of the Earth one week uh, because uh, that's that's all gold. And um, I, I think that's probably the work, uh, despite it all. It, it's not in political theology, nor in political theology too, that uh, that that Schmidt's real success as a political theologian really comes through. It's in Nomos of the Earth. It's it's when he's dealing with the translation of all of these uh, pre-Christian Roman categories into the system of Christianity, and then their secularization and their transformation in the new nomos of the earth, what, what he calls the new nomos of the earth, the, the JPE. And, um, uh, you know, but in, in a way that's pertinent or interesting to us, his narrative in a way cuts off right when things get interesting and vital for us. He doesn't remark upon, he doesn't, I mean, he, he kind of implies some things, but he doesn't openly uh, remark upon the United States as a, as a new imperial power, as a new kind of imperial power. He doesn't really remark on the new, new nomos of the earth, the one that supersedes and replaces the JPE, the system of, of competing sovereign states in, in Europe um, and their empires abroad. Uh, but, uh, but, I, but I definitely think we should we should do that at some point. It will allow us to discuss not just political theology, but uh, the geopolitics of the now and uh, and the geopolitics to come. So basically what he's saying, Nails, is we're keeping you here indefinitely. You're stuck. Yeah, you can't leave. Yeah. <laughs> I'm stuck in limbo. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, we could work that out another time. Um, I think it's time okay. we come and wrap this up. So I think for the last bit, what you guys should say, myself included, is tell the audience why you should read Schmidt and Agamben. And I'll give my answer in one sentence. I'll just say, if Agamben and Schmidt are correct, that the sacred man, the accursed man, is the constitution and the origin of the sovereign, then that would mean, at least insofar as your retainers and your mere existence is the creation and that which receives the apocalyptic, the coming of a new world order, then we have a lot more potential to, in the terms of changing what sovereignty is and what that world order actually is than you probably think you do. If Shemit and Agamben are correct that the sacred, the homo soccer, is the constitution of sovereignty. So FZ, then Nils, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, you should engage with Schmidt uh, and Agamben uh, and Schmidt's other followers, because uh, one of the serious misconceptions that lies, one of the structures that lies beneath uh, everything we think uh, politically in the modern world, and plenty of non-political things beside, is is a is a kind of liberal or pre-liberal theory of the origin of power, of the origin of man, of the origin of the state which is manifestly untrue. Uh, that is to say, the what you could broadly class as social contract theories, the social contract tradition. Um, these traditions are necessary for, uh, for liberalism to have a kind of coherence. Uh, you could argue that they're even necessary for capitalism to have a, and for, for, for modernity to have a, a coherence. Uh, but they, ultimately are incoherent on their own terms. And Schmidt offers a, a much better look at, you could say, the kind of originary scene of sovereignty, uh, how it works and how it's implicated in, uh, how, how it's implicated in us as religious beings as well, as beings who, who, who do have a kind of a, a sacredness to ourselves and in relation to each other, but a, 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 a sacred or almost magical connection to the world. 
um, uh, a, a way that is uh, a way of relating to the world that isn't uh, purely based on some kind of economistic or logical or or rational uh, computation of interests and uh, uh, yeah, so I, that's that's really why Schmidt should be reread and and reconsidered, and ultimately, I think why Schmidt should come to replace. Uh, to to a certain extent to replace Hobbes and 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 uh, those who come after him Rousseau Rawls uh, all of those who stand in the social contract tradition uh, as a way of thinking about uh, power and its origins. Reed Schmidt. All right, you Nils. Uh, yeah, I I pretty much second that. Um, reading Schmidt is especially important if you have never yet considered what actually is politics. Um, Schmidt has written extensively. He's written numerous books, a myriad of, of articles. Uh, there are numerous I believe dozens, if if not hundreds, of uh, Carl Schmidt and X Y Z books by now. There are various correspondences that have been published, mainly in German. Some, I believe, are also already in English, especially when uh, Leo Strauss uh, is involved, because uh, that guy was pretty important for uh, the uh, neocons in in the early noughts and their influence on uh, the Bush administration, as well as, at least allegedly, he is now because uh, the guys around the Claremont Institute, uh, who are more or less on the side of uh, a, a an edgy civic nationalism in the US and the leftover neocons are now kind of fighting out their differences between West Coast Straussians and East Coast Straussians. Uh, long story short, Schmidt has the talent of uh, both writing very succinctly and in a uh, in a darkly illuminating way. So if uh, you have never yet thought about uh, what really makes the state a state and what makes constitutional law constitutional law, where does a constitution come from? Uh, if you have never yet thought about this and have never been interested, go give Schmidt a try and you might discover things that you have not yet dreamed about. Read his four central works, which are political theology, Concept of the political legitimacy, uh, legality, and legitimacy, uh, um, and the crisis of parliamentary democracy. Uh, those are all pretty short books. They can mainly be uh, read through in one sitting, and uh, then you might have been uh, you might have you might have been uh, transfixed on this whole topic. And uh, with regards to Agamben, as well as most uh, so-called postmodern or post-structuralist thinkers, um, it's necessary to keep in mind that the 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 stage of world development we live in now uh, has become accelerated in a way uh, that would have been considered impossible about fifty or let's say even thirty years ago. And uh, everything is going so fast and developing in, in ways that 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 uh, that blast the barriers of the human mind. That uh, just training one's own mind to think in ways that are different than what we have been taught in school uh, is a value in and of itself. We might see the end of the nation state, if we like it or not. We might see some kind of, of global conflict or global, uh, global, global uh, 
pacification uh, being born that we might not yet be able to imagine and and stuff like this French school that uh, some left-wing liberals and of course pretty much all conservatives uh, with a capital C we see nowadays at least in the West will uh, completely and utterly condemn my teach us a few things uh, that will make us able to 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 think and to react in ways that might not be necessary yet but might be might well be necessary in the future so schmidt will pr pretty much uh never get old as long as there's politics as we know it but there sooner or later rather soon uh, might be politics or developments that we cannot yet grasp with the set of concepts and ideas that we have been uh that we have been assigned by our educational system and our uh our, our uh, humanities and so thinking in a non-traditional non uh non-orthodox even non-linear way like uh, some post-structuralist thinkers would uh would propose uh, can only be helpful in in becoming aware of certain problems that that have not yet completely uh, unraveled themselves in uh, today's in uh, today's today's societies of uh, late capitalism late industrialism and uh, thus we might actually see uh, some 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 neo china <laughs> emerging from its own ashes after the coronavirus uh epidemic like uh, nick land predicted uh, back in his heyday in in the mid 90s and uh considering both the classics even if they are uh notorious classics like carl schmidt uh and unorthodox thinkers of the last uh 30 to 40 years like uh, Agamben or Foucault and others that are considered communists or, or strange links, especially like Foucault or Georges Bataille can be very worthwhile because let's be honest, all these so-called orthodox and normal and uh, estimated thinkers have more or less left us where we are now. So uh, it's time to look for new influences. That is really awesomely put. We're certainly glad to have you here for this Schmidt series, and I'm sure we'll definitely see you again. Now to the audience, I hope, for one thing, you like the new mic. Please let me know that it sounds better finally. Go click like, share, subscribe. You know the deal. On uh, Monday, we have, with FZ there, we have... A special guest, Zero HP Lovecraft. We're going to talk about HP Lovecraft in cinema. So that should be fun. Be ready to watch that tomorrow. Now, that all being said, you certainly have, with the series we just did here with Nils, a good toolbox to understanding why the idea and the, the liberal universal invocation of human rights is not something in which, when you end up thrown in the prison and have your rights taken away for being a dissident, is not an aberration, but rather that is a direct result of those language of human rights and liberalism that we just talked about. So I'll say this. So I won't say homo sacer because, you know, no homo. <laughs> but go forth, uh, sacred man in rupture world order. See you next time. Thanks for listening in.